one of the things that I've thought about, I think about microservices and one of the anti-patterns that I see with teams professing to adopt microservices is missing that distributed nature of development, not just the system. So, so, so we are distributing development as distrib distributing responsibility and decision making as well as, as the technical components of the system. And, and that's really for the, to not to my mind, I don't know whether you would agree, but, but the, 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 you know, one of the key values of that is that scalability of development that you get as a result. By, by making these teams more autonomous, more responsible for every aspect, they have more freedom of movement, more freedom of action. They are able to respond to change much more effectively. For, for us, that has certainly been the case. And I'm not here to argue that microservices is the, the perfect architecture for every use case. But for us, sure. Spotify has been lucky enough to grow very quickly throughout our lifetime. And for us, it's been it's been a very powerful architecture and set of practices for that scalability and for maintaining the distributed action, that, the distributed aspect that you're mentioning. Of course, I should be clear, like the, it's not that every team build things completely willy nilly, like it, it needs to fit into a larger, the larger company strategy and the larger product yeah. strategy. So there's some, some degree of alignment that is happening as well, but that like all of those day-to-day -day decisions that you take as part of building and evolving and maintaining your systems that we've been able to like keep pretty local in the team. And that I think is very powerful. And we've been able to see the flip side of this because we have, as I said, we made our mistakes along the, along the way, of course, and we've definitely ended up with cases where we built accidentally or not more monolithic uh, architectures. We had our yeah. mobile apps be very heavily monolithic. We had parts of our backend be pretty monolithic and we've gone through the, the pains of that and seen like, okay, so now we need to do a ton of coordination between many different teams to shape our software. And like, we can see how painful that is compared to where we've been able to break things down into more of the microservices type of pattern. So, um, yeah, for us, it's been a great model. And but as as I think you're you're kind of hinting at, like any other engineering dis decision, there are kind of trade offs. So, so 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 and and things that you have to manage. I assume that when you're talking about fleet management, that's part of what you're talking about. Is is okay? You've got this distributed organization and technical infrastructure of small pieces. How do you kind of point those pieces in a, in a consistent, in a coherent direction from a business point of view and from an organization wide point of view. Yeah. And, and how do you, so that's part of it. So we've really thought about this in a few different, um, relate highly related strategies, but it's really down to, uh, what we like standardizing your technology stack. So we, within Spotify, this is called golden technologies. So yeah. I can talk more about that if we want to like, reduce the amount of uh, fragmentation that we have in our technology ecosystem. And then that coupled with fleet management, where we started this discussion on really trying to automate as much of the management of or ma maintenance of those components as possible. Yeah. That, that's, 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 there's, there's two interesting things in there, I, I, I think. But... I, I might be misremembering, so do correct me if I'm wrong. But but my recollection of you know, part one of the things that made Spotify visible to lots of people was the stuff that that, that you you guys published years ago with Henry Nyberg's um, animations about your development yep. process and so on. My, one of my recollections from that, and one one of one of my recollections of the takes from that is that is that the technical choices in those forms, what language you're going to program a particular piece in, was was a choice of the team at the time. That was not necessarily the case. So we've always had okay. some level of uh, guidelines and guardrails. So if you go down to the to the programming language, for example, that's some, something that we've always been pretty strongly opinionated around. We've had a set yeah. of languages that we that we want our teams to use. And I would say over time, we've introduced more and more of those. Like we've moved, slowly moved our way up the stack in terms of where we want to standardize yeah. across the company. There's still, 
you can make exceptions for that where there's a, a good reason for it, but then at least we want there to be a, a healthy discussion around that yeah. decision and, and, and have some accountability for the decision. But uh, yeah, so so it's not, yeah, there's a fair amount of, of, of guidelines. And, and the reason for that is really to have both nowadays for the automation uh, reasons, and I can talk more about that, but also to have just have fluidity in the organizations. We can move ownership of components around in the org. We can change the org structure without, you know, yeah. some team all of a sudden taking on something that is written in a in the language that they might not be familiar with or, or whatnot. And just being able to move, like have people have mobility within the organization so they can switch a team and they don't have to completely relearn the stack. So I think that's been mostly a good set choice for us, but it's definitely a trade-off, of course. Like it's it's... Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, I'm, I, I would, I, I would, I would agree with with, with with that from from my background, which you know is largely from not on your scale, but certainly in in the realm of larger systems and larger teams, and and so you know that flexibility of having the ability for people and pieces to to move around the organization i think is a valuable one to have what where would you see the trade-offs between between you know, you know the, the full autonomy of the, the, every decision is made within the team and autonomy within some constraints within some i think you use the term guide rails um i would use the term guide rails anyway so, so having some guide rails for, for that kind of decision making I must admit, I'm probably more in line with the guide rails than the full autonomy, personally. <laughs> yeah, I, I think I am as well, just to be, make my biases clear as well. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so I would, I don't know if this is a good classification, but like I would maybe think about it as you can have the accidental fragmentation where you make decisions based on, you know, some individual's preference or um, experience from previous work life or whatever yeah. that are not necessarily a better choice from a company strategy or like supporting the actual problem you're trying to solve there's in my experience lots of that will go on unless you put some some type of guard race in place and yeah. then you can have the intentional fragmentation where so let me take an example from our our world of uh, when you write the back-end service most of uh, spotify's back-end services are java based since 10 years or so ago. And there are, of course, use specific cases or edge cases where Java might not be the best programming language for a specific type of problem that we're faced with. And then we have to make a trade off between the needs of that specific problem and that specific domain versus the type of gains we can get from fleet management automation, for example, because yeah. we all of a sudden build a service in Rust, because Rust is amazing to do uh, transcoding or whatever it might be. Mm -hmm. That might be great for solving that problem, but that team is now stuck with the maintaining a solution that is poorly supported by our, by our infrastructure teams, will not get any of the automation we have in place because we do not support that, um, that stack internally. So those are the types of trade-offs that, we, that we're faced with. And yeah. I wouldn't say they're super common i think we've picked a set of technologies that fit you know some 90 10 type of, of of thinking of by far most of the use cases we have should fit within the technology stacks that we standardize on but we also have we also acknowledge that there will be some percentage that will not so if we go back and look at our i mentioned as golden technologies which has been our program for driving a higher degree of standardization the long-term target we have for that is to reach 85% adoption. And that is exactly to retain a certain buffer where we have these edge cases and we have a certain amount of experimentation and innovation going on so we can try out new technologies and whatnot. So, so yeah, I, 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 like we're not striving to get to 100% because we actually think that would be counterproductive to what we want. Yeah, yeah I, I, I think that's an excellent point. And I, 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 you know, organizationally part of the freedom that you want if somebody invents the world's greatest programming language ever, ever you want somebody in your organization to be trying it out and using it so that you can find out how good it is and, and exactly. start adopting it so you need that room for innovation and discovery as as a part of your strategy i, I would assume yeah 
So going back to the autonomy, like the, the autonomy that we want our teams to have is really around what's your product strategy and aligning that with our overall strategy, of course. And and within that, like what are the software components you need to solve that problem more yeah. so than reinventing the infrastructure that those components ends up being built on. Like that's, we've standardized yeah. on, the, on the infrastructure level, but left a fair amount of flexibility on the application level. So that's roughly, yeah. I think. And I guess the, um, the the other aspect of that is is the nature of the decision making around those 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 trade offs. So I would put this in terms of you know an architect's or an engineer's perspective on on these sorts of things. It has to be framed by the economic value of the choices that we make. You know, it's it would be dumb to you know if 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 every developer was picking their own development language to pad their CVs, that would be a bad economic choice from Spotify's point of view. Yeah, but, exactly. But so the, the, so these some of these conversations, some of these discuss, uh, decisions need to be more strategic than that. Yep, that is absolutely right. And and Spotify, like many companies nowadays, also have a shared platform. We have a platform team that builds that internal platform for yeah. us on top of our cloud. Uh, environment and we want to that is expensive that's a big investment for us and yeah. of course we want to be able to deduplicate those investments as much as we can so the the fewer the fewer technology stacks we need to support internally the better off we are so but again it's a trade-off around those uh, against those um, local domain based needs that we have this clip was taken from my podcast the engineering room with dave farley a monthly podcast with some of the brightest minds in software engineering. You can find full episodes on all your favourite podcast platforms, including Spotify, Apple Podcasts and Amazon Music. Your support helps us to bring you these regular episodes, so please leave your positive review on your preferred podcast platform to help us to continue to grow and bring you great guests and their insights. Thank you very much for listening.